Hi, and welcome. I'm Steve Martorano, and this is The Behavioral Corner. You're invited to hang with us as we discuss the ways we live today, the choices we make, the things we do, and how they affect our health and well-being. So you're on the corner, the behavioral corner. Please hang around a while. So here we are in the corner again. Hi, everybody. Uh, Steve Mortorano. It's September. We find ourselves at September, which is designated as many things. I think it's uh, September's among many other things. Be, be you know, be good to your garden month. Uh, but, but it's also uh, seriously um, National Recovery Month. In that context, it refers specifically to recovery from substance abuse and long-term sobriety, which lots and lots of people are successful at. We're going to expand that to include recovery from just everything. You know what I'm talking about. So we're going to take a little break um, and talk about football, which I know our guest believes is good for the soul. Merle Reese has been for a very long time uh, considered the voice of something, which is a hell of a designation. He's the voice of the Philadelphia Eagles professional football team. Uh, Merle is a a longtime friend of mine and a former colleague. We worked together many years ago, and we are delighted to have Merle Uh, Talk to us about what he does, how he's going to do it during a pandemic, and uh, he'll answer the question of whether he thinks football is good for the soul. As we hang on the corner with him, Merle, thanks for joining us on the corner. Good to be with you, Steve. It's it's always good to speak with you, and I do remember fondly the days that we worked together uh, on the morning show at WIP. Always a lot of fun, and never knew where you were going with uh, <laughs> what you were going to hit me with on a particular morning, but we enjoyed every minute of it. You know, Merle, I'm going to, I'm going to take a moment of personal privilege here to talk about that. You were the master of paying very close attention. I would do the lead in for, for, I'd say, well, it's eight o'clock in the morning and now Merle's here with, you know, the latest on what's happening. And you were the master at taking the last thought or sometimes even the last word in my sentence and, deftly segueing it into your lead. You know, if I said something like, uh, Merle's here, and as you know, really tough weekend. Hi, Merle. And you would say, tough indeed, right? You do that. It was just brilliant. So I would, I, I never I never told you this, but I would spend a little bit of time before each break going, what word could I use that he couldn't, oh, my goodness. that he couldn't possibly work it, and no matter what I did, you know, I'd say something like, and Merle's here now, and I'm going to go down to the uh, to the men's room. And you would go, all right, Steve, well, the men's room is where the Eagles found themselves. And I would say, he's brilliant. He's just the you see, that was That was better than – I worked for, with a woman at WIP named Carol Ann Kell. Do you remember Carol Ann Yeah, Kell? I do remember the name, sure. She, she, she did the news. And she knew nothing about sports. And she would do the newscast. And she would lead it to me. But before, she would say to me, uh, Merrill, uh, what should I say to lead into you? And I'd give her a lead. And she'd say to me, uh, and she, you know, Merrill – the Phillies really went deep in the bullpen last night. And one day she did that, and I said, what do you mean by that, Carol? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and she she chased me around the newsroom for 10 minutes. <laughs> she wanted to kill me. That's not fair. But I, I never told you that. I, I, my hand to God, when you said you, you often didn't know where I was going, that's because I was trying to – I was actually trying to run you up a blind alley. I, Oh, I mean, I would work reservoir in and you would go deep water is where they find themselves. Uh, that's right. That's right. You were, you, were, you were the best. OK, that's why you become the voice of something. You know, uh, you know, I, I was reading the uh, your Wikipedia entry. I didn't know that you were the longest tenured play by play announcer in the National Football League. Is that right? It's a nice way of saying I'm old. <laughs> Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> but but I am. This is my 44th year now. Brad Sham, who does the Dallas Cowboys, is um, we've actually we actually started around the same time. Actually, he started a year before me. He started as the color analyst with Vern Lundquist, and I started as the color analyst with Charlie Swift. But then somewhere along the line, uh, probably about uh, 20 years ago, on a television show, he asked Jerry Jones. Uh, a question that Jerry Jones didn't care for, and for three years he was banished to the Texas Rangers to do baseball, and then he came back. But mine are continuous. Yeah, yeah and um, that shows you the kind of minefield uh, guy in your position often has to walk. 44 years as the voice of the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, I know you know these answers. H- how many owners have you have you uh, worked through? <laughs> 
Um, well, when I began, it was Leonard Tose. It became Norman Brayman and then Jeffrey Lurie. So there are three. Oh, so three. Uh, how many coaches? Head coaches. Uh, head coaches. Uh, well, I'm not going back to the to the pre and post game shows. Just as the play by play guy, it was Dick Vermeil, followed by Marion Campbell, uh, followed by Ray Rhodes, followed by Richie Kotite. Uh, but followed by Buddy, no, Buddy Ryan, and then Richie Kotite, and then Andy Reid, and then the worst of all, Chip Kelly, and then uh, Doug Peterson, who's done a great job. Yeah, you know, I'm just sorry I asked you that question because you reminded me of Chip Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> I know. If you had skip- I, I try to stay away from that. <laughs> if you had skipped the name, I don't think anybody would have caught would have caught you. Well, that's a, you know, it's amazing. That's, that's an amazing tenure, and. Uh, yeah, I won't get you. I won't ask you to name all the color, uh, the color partners you've had, uh, the, the guys who do the, uh, you know, the up close and personal. But I remember Stan Walters real well. You and he were great together. Now, of course, it's Mike Quick. Mike for a lot of years, right? Mm-hmm. Well, Mike for, believe it or not, for twenty four years. This was Mike's twenty fourth year. Um, it's it's funny. People don't even remember. they the, the young kids don't remember that he was a football player. They think of him as a broadcaster. But, yeah, actually, I started uh, my first color analyst cause, because I took over the play-by-play with two weeks, uh, two games to go in the 1977 season. Charlie Swift had been the play-by-play guy, and he died suddenly with two games to go. And uh, they, they called me and said, you're doing the play-by-play Sunday. Go get a color man. And the one person who lived in the area who I was friendly with was a Hall of Fame former Packer and Cowboy by the name of Herb Adderley. So Herb Adderley did the last two games of the 77th season, was not a candidate to continue because he had joined the Temple coaching staff. And from there it was Jim Barniak, and Jim Barniak gave way to Bill Berge, and Bill Berge gave way to Stan Walters, who did it for 14 years, and Mike has done the last 24. Wow, Mike Quick has been out of football that long. You're right. There is a whole generation that doesn't remember what a great receiver he was for the Philadelphia Eagles. Well, it's it again, and it's a it's a remarkable, remarkable career. Um, and um, we we're so you know, I know people in this town are grateful that they got to listen to you call games. As anybody who knows uh, broadcasting around here, watching football, it's a right. It's an absolute rite of passage when you first realize you could turn down the television sound and listen to Merle and Mike do the game rather than the network guys. Um, I, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you, I mean, your life, like all of our lives professionally and privately have been impacted by the pandemic. What's going to change about doing play by play for this season? Well, in the first place, you're doing it in a stadium without fans. And they have moved us from our broadcast booth on the 50-yard line, but very, very tight. We were practically sitting on each other's laps uh, down a level, uh, still on the 50-yard line, even closer to the action, uh, to a suite. We now have a large suite, with complete with its own lobby and bar and, and restroom and everything else, and uh, an unoccupied suite. And Mike will sit four seats to my right. And then to my left is my spotter, Bill Werndell. And Billy and I are separated by a plexiglass, a sheet of plexiglass. And our statistician, uh, Terry Small, will sit behind us in another row in this suite. And uh, he will be giving me the statistics on a screen instead of flashing me numbers or holding up a grid and pointing to 37 yards on the last play, I'll get it on a screen. My producer, Joe McPeak, will also stand behind me, uh, separated with a plexiglass, and instead of handing me drop-in cards where I would read uh, on the PNC football network or whatever, the, the, the you know, in the so-and-so red zone, those <laughs> those drop-ins will come up on a screen. Right, right, right. So it will be, it really will be socially set up. Can you see? Any- oh, oh, and the other thing, yeah. the other thing is, we will not travel because David y- David Yagerov, our market manager, felt that since uh, the Eagles playing this year, where we usually travel with the team, 
will be occupied by only essential football personnel. He didn't want Mike and I jumping on commercial aircraft, walking mm-hmm. through airports, mm-hmm. grabbing cabs and Ubers. Uh, he felt that was not safe. And so we are doing the away games from that aforementioned suite, but we will have two 60-inch monitors. So you will be doing uh, professionally what the rest of us have done our entire lives, sit in front of a television screen and yes. uh, and do play-by-play in our heads. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Have you- uh-huh. And we will, have, we will have crowd noise piped in by the NFL. Let me ask you a question. Um, I don't think I've ever asked you this. As you do the games when they are in front of you in the stadium, how much time do you spend watching the field as opposed in, in real time, as opposed to watching a monitor? I watch the field a hundred percent of the time. Really, uh, and and for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that uh, the monitor is delayed. Uh, we're getting the TV oh, feed, right. in, which in, has, yeah. has been delayed. Uh, the other time, the other thing is, uh, I will watch it, uh, except, except in Dallas. Uh, and the reason in Dallas is that you, you have that AT&T stadium, which my son refers to as a monument to excess. Mm. And we are in a suite in Dallas, but our suite is way up in the air and it's in a corner of the end zone. So when they move downfield, these little specks, they, there is that 60-yard screen that sits there in AT&T Stadium with uh, everything in real time. So when they move to my right across the 50, I focus on this big screen that hangs from the roof. Yeah. So that's, that's what I focus on in Dallas. Yeah. But. Other than that, I focus on the field. The only time I look over on the monitor and Mike watches it is when they go with a replay. Right. When they're showing us whether he's in or out or there's a contested call. Mm -hmm. That's the only time I use a monitor. Yeah, you know, a couple of other nuts and bolts. I love talking uh, not so much the game with you, but, but how you do it and what that's all about. It's fascinating to me. I've always thought someone should write a slim book made up of the expert people who do what you do for a living in any city and they do baseball, they do basketball, they do hockey and they do football and ask those guys to write uh, a couple of words on how to watch the game. Cause I think a lot of people who watch sports, you know, don't watch it closely enough to really be knowledgeable about what's going on. Who should a fan be looking at when a play begins to unfold? Should they be looking at the linemen to see if they're pass blocking or run blocking? Should they be looking at the quarterback uh, what's the smart, informed fan look at? You know, it's it's interesting you, that you say that because a former general manager of the New York Jets, uh, Pat Kerwin, his name is, wrote a wrote a book a couple of years ago that I read uh, called uh, "Keep Your Eye Off the Ball," and it's it's a real education of football and tells you where to look. Now, as a fan, if I were going to a game. Uh, I would do what I do. Basically, I would follow the ball. When people say to me, how Lane Johnson play? I say, well, I, I guess he played all right because Carson Wentz didn't get sacked from that right side. But uh, I'm not really watching Lane Johnson. I'm watching the ball as a play-by-play guy. Mm-hmm. Now, my spotter, Billy Wendell, we have about 30 different hand signals between us. And he, after a play, can take his right fist and punch it into his left palm and then point to a number. And I can say, Isaac Siamalo threw a great block ah. on that play. Ah. Or he can, he can show me that so-and-so deflected the pass. Or that uh, so-and-so was the second man. He'll give me the two fingers and then point to a tackler and show me that he was the second man in on the tackle. And there's a whole bunch of, we have 30 hand signals between us, but more or less, the only way to enjoy a game is to watch the ball. Yeah. But, but there's no harm in taking your eye off the ball for a few plays here and there. If you want to see how the rookie left tackle was doing, follow him, put your binoculars on him, 
for one or two plays mm-hmm. and then flash back to the ball mm-hmm. or uh, look at this look at the corners to see how they're shifting around uh, when you go into nickel coverage and things like that that's fine to do occasionally but you can't really follow a game unless you follow the ball well, you, and yes, and, and in that regard, naturally, you would follow the ball more closely than anybody because, after all, your principal job is to tell people uh, what just right. happened, how far the ball went forward or, or the ball went backward. And I want to get into this because uh, this is, you know, we're on the behavioral corner. We talk about the things in our lives that affect our health mentally and spiritually, um, and that has a lot to do with our behaviors. I want to really talk about what you, your, your impression is and the thoughts you have over the years about what football means. Now, we know it's not football coming back now in a couple of weeks, less than a couple of weeks, is uh, not going to cure most of what's going on in the country right now. You know what all that is, civil strife, pandemics, politics, the whole thing. But it, it's also not nothing. And I know as a, as a broadcaster, you are first and foremost a communicator, and you communicate in that booth much more than down in distance. Are you aware that people are hanging on your every word and you have an effect on their psyches? Well, that's part of it. That's part of it. And the reason I'm aware of it was from the time I was three or four years old, I was huddled up to a radio hanging on somebody else's every word. I grew up like that. I was the kid who when my parents told me, lights out, it's time to go to sleep, and the Phillies were on the West Coast, smuggled the transistor radio under the covers and listened till the very last out was made at 2.30 in the morning. And then they had to drag me out of bed to go to school the next day. Yeah, exa- <laughs> exactly. And you you were listening to who, by Sam and Bill Campbell and those guys? Well, the, the first one I remember listening to was an announcer by the name of Gene Kelly. Oh, yes. And, and then, of course, by Sam. And uh, with the Eagles, it was the great Bill Campbell, who became a wonderful friend. Yeah. So, so then you know what I mean when I say if, a, if an announcer is, is not in tune with who's listening to these broadcasts, they can have a, a very significant effect on people's, you know, uh, not their not their physical well-being, but their emotions. They can definitely have an effect on their emotions. Is, is that is that something you're conscious of? Or are you just in there, you know, I'm a pro, I know how to do this, and however people feel, that's the way they feel. Which way do you fall on that? No, I, I don't fall in any, any of those categories. I fall in the category that I study all week. I, I really do. I, I study all week. I memorize numbers. I go to practice. I watch plays. I watch game tape. I watch what's called end zone offense and defense of the opponent that they're playing. And I, I spent hours and hours and hours preparing so that when Mike Quick and I go on the air, people get the impression that we're just two guys hanging out, watching a football game and enjoying it with them. That's, that's the impression. But there's so much going on in the booth mechanically and so many cues coming on and commercials to do. There's a lot of business going on, but I want people to be detached from all of that and just feel that with their friends in the booth trying to transmit not only the action, but also the emotion and the excitement and the entire ambience of the stadium. I mean, I'd like to give a weather report from the standpoint of the field being three quarters shadowed at that point with the sky being December serious. I mean, I like to paint a picture. Mm-hmm. That's my job to mm-hmm. paint a picture. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's not something at this point that I consciously do. I just, it, it, it would be paralysis by analysis or it would become contrived. It's just something that's, that's part of me for doing it for so long. And uh, it's, it, it comes out that way. But I'm, I'm speaking to the listeners as if I'm speaking to one person, to a close friend telling him or her what is happening and what it feels like. Uh, yes, and it's in that vein that I, I asked the question, not so much that you plan to do it. You and everybody else who does what you do and does it well are then connected on a very deep level to the fans' hopes, their aspirations for their teams, and their heartache. Uh, all of that results in this phenomenon that occurs, and I know you've seen it, although you've not been victim of it, where the, the typical fan will... Um, hear and listen to 
a national broadcaster doing a local game and assume immediately that they don't like the team. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that, that's what they think. And it, it used to, when we were in college, I remember one of our communications professors who was also a news anchor uh, on the weekends at Channel 6, John Roberts. And he once told us that when the public views a news anchor, every Republican thinks that that news anchor is a Democrat. Exactly. And every Democrat thinks he's a Republican. It's, it's the same thing with the network uh, broadcasters. Uh, they come in. And everybody thinks that Joe Buck and Troy Aikman hate the Eagles and that they want the Cowboys. And I I really believe, to be honest with you, that as much as Troy Aikman cared about his Cowboys as a player and still may root for them inwardly, he does a professional job and he's he's being honest and he's Mm -hmm. being he's really being candid and saying what he is watching and what he believes. Same thing when. Chris Collingsworth, who works with Al Michaels, was doing the Super Bowl at the television Super Bowl that the Eagles won. There were a couple of times when he disagreed and he felt that Corey Clements' catch would be overruled. And I think he thought the same thing of Zach Ertz. That was not because he wanted the Eagles to have that play go against them or that he was rooting for the Patriots. It's just how he saw that play. Uh, fortunately, I saw both of those plays in the other direction, but I can promise you that if I thought Zach Ertz's catch was not a catch, I would have said it. Well, I, I would have I, said that, and many times I've said that yes. I think the Eagles you know, just benefited on a play that, that should have been overruled. No, absolutely. Anybody who's listened to you knows that candor is, uh, is uh, you ought to be your middle name. I mean, uh, that's that's. there's no doubt you're not a homer. We know where your heart is, but your professional ability goes beyond that. And this is what I want to get to. First of all, I want to ask you the question of, uh, that sort of began this thing. And that, do you think it's important? I mean, there was a question up until a few weeks ago whether there would be any sport, sports in America. Certainly, football was thought to be the hardest to put together under these circumstances. Do you think it's important that there be football in the fall and through the uh, rest of the year? I do think it's important. I think it's very important. I think that we need that. For our mental health, I think we need diversions. I need, I think we need to have a feeling that our emotions can come out, that we don't just sit around 24 hours a day concentrating on the number of deaths of the pandemic or when the vaccine is coming out. We don't know these things, but we need diversions. And I think football is a wonderful diversion because there is so much attached to it. And another thing, Steve, I was reading, I, I don't believe there will be high school football in Philadelphia. There will be in some areas because the governor did not say or outlaw high school sports. He advised against them, and some school districts are mm-hmm. complying with that wish. But, uh, for example, I think there were a lot of players, young men, uh, who play football, and they need that outlet to channel them in a positive direction because these are aggressive guys who, and and some of them come from troubled backgrounds and they need this to get all of this pan up emotion out of their bodies rather than turning it into negative pursuits. This has always been a tough nut to crack. Uh, any, anybody who thinks it's easy to try to figure out what the right things to do under these circumstances is kidding themselves It's a very, very daunting task. Every storm runs out of rain, according to the great Maya Angelou. Her words can remind us of one very simple truth, that storms do cross our paths, but they don't last forever. So the question remains, how do we ride out this storm of COVID-19 and all the other storms life may throw our way? 
Where do we turn when issues such as mental health or substance abuse begin to deeply affect our lives? Look to Retreat Behavioral Health. With a team of industry-leading experts, they work tirelessly to provide a compassionate, holistic, and affordable treatment. Call to learn more today. 855-802-6600. Retreat Behavioral Health, where healing happens. Uh, Merle Reese is uh, hanging with us on the corner. Um, he is the long time, 44 years now, voice of the Philadelphia Eagles professional football team and uh, an old pal as well. By the way, if, if the kids usually come by on the corner here and they do a pickup game in the street, maybe you can do, uh, you can do color. On the <laughs> show. I want to bring this back to what responsibility or not, yeah, not responsibility, but how aware you are again that people have a lot invested, maybe too much sometimes, in the outcome of, of a football game or any sporting event. You're their conduit to that. You're the guy who brings them the message. Even if they're looking at the same thing you're looking at, the announcer shapes the mood, can almost set the agenda. I mean, if he's bad, he could ruin the whole experience. If he's good, he, he adds more to it. Are you aware of all that responsibility? You do, in a sense, have the psyches of a lot of people in your hands on any given Sunday. Are you aware of that? I am. And, and Angelo Cataldi uh, on WIP's morning show has had, used to have me on, but still has me on, but used to say to me prior to 2018, February 4th, 2018, he used to say to me, you know, Merle, for all the years you've done the games, more than anybody, I want you to have a winning Super Bowl the broadcast, he said, that would really, really put the the punctuation mark on your career, wouldn't it? And I said to Angelo, and I mean this sincerely, well, I, I certainly want the Eagles to win a Super Bowl, but the Eagles have given me so much. Football has given me so much and so many great memories. I mean, there were the the the, the miracles of the Meadowlands, two of them, and there were the, the all the great games that I can think of, and I would I could name ten of them in a minute that every Eagles fan would would identify. Some of them even had names, the fog ball, the body by game. You know, they got to go on and on about stuff like that. They don't owe me anything. I have a career that I, I get up every morning and can't wait to get down to practice. I, I, I wake up on a Sunday morning scared to death, nervous, head in my stomach, nervous until I go on the air. I love every second of it. I said, I want them to win the Super Bowl for the fans. These are the people who invest so much in this team. Some of the mortgage take on second mortgages so they can get season tickets. People spend their last dollars rather than buying anything for themselves to buy their kids Carson Wentz jerseys or you know any, any kind of Eagles paraphernalia for Christmas. I mean, the money and the emotion and the heart that this fan base has put in this team is is enormous. I wanted for them. Yeah. And then when we got to the Super Bowl, and I, the week before, Paul Domwich of the Daily News asked me a question. He said, "Will you write an ending? Will you write what you're going to say if the Eagles win the Super Bowl?" And I think you know that a lot of broadcasters do do things like that, so they have exactly the poetic mm -hmm. words that they want at their hands if that occurs. And I said to Paul, no, I will not, because I just want my emotion to spill forth. I've been doing this long enough to believe that if it happens, that I will just react in, in an appropriate way. So we came down to the last play, and it was one last heave for the end zone by Tom Brady. And I'm sitting there scared to death. Now, I'm not scared to death that the Patriots are going to complete that pass because, first of all, the Eagles were up by eight points, not seven. So they would have had to complete a Hail Mary and then complete a, a, a two-point conversion. And plus, I didn't think Brady had quite <laughs> yeah. the arm like Aaron Rodgers to put it up there that far that high. But what I was frightened about is that we were seated – in the corner of the opposite end zone, and that pass was going to come down approximately 110 yards away from where I was seated, 
and I wasn't sure that I'd be able to pick it up clearly enough. You'd be the last and, guy. And, you'd be the last guy in the building to know what happened. Oh, I did not want to be known as the broadcaster who blew the finish to the Super Bowl. <laughs> but anyhow, I saw it go up, and all of a sudden, everything seemed to go in slow motion. It just slowed down, and I clearly saw it batter around. And finally, when it hit the ground, I said, it's incomplete. The game is over. I looked up at the clock, and there were nothing but zeros. And I said, the game is over. The Philadelphia Eagles are Super Bowl champions. And then I paused and I said, Eagles fans everywhere, this is for you. Let the celebration begin. That was perfect. It was perfect. That was all I had to say. Yeah, yeah, it was perfect. Listen, by the way, uh, now that you refresh my memory, you know as well as I that if he had completed that pass at the end of the game, they would have scored the two-point conversion. You know those sons of bitches would have done that again. Okay, anyway, listen, uh, Merle, Merle, thanks so much for this because, like I said at the, at the top, we, we do need a break every now and then. It is not selfish or foolish to just shut down the uh, craziness. It's not going to go away, but you need a, a respite from that, and you're going to provide that along with that football team as we go into the fall. And I'm not here to tell, and neither are you, anybody that football is the most important thing, but it ain't nothing. And so I'm glad it's back, and I'm I'm glad for the 45th year now, I guess, uh, we will hear you and Mike do those football Well, this, this, is, the, this is the 44th, oh, this and, I, uh, you know, and, I, and people say, how long do you want to do this? I said, <laughs> they're going to have to take a crane to remove me because it's what I love to do more than anything else in the world. And I'm not leaving. <laughs> well, they got you in that nice suite. Now you can kick back and really take it easy. You, you know, it's going to spoil us because hopefully next year this pandemic is over and we go back into our closet. <laughs> <laughs> well, give my regards to your team, whom I've known for a very long time. I know your, your producer, uh, Joe McPeak, who's just a, a great kid. And the story about how he got the job is fantastic. I got to have you back on someday to talk about him praying in the plane with the, with Buddy Ryan. There's so many stories. Oh. Merle, thanks so much. Have a great season, and uh, I hope uh, you get to call a lot of W's, not for your sake, but for mine. I, I hope so, Steve. I have no idea what's going to happen in that regard. There have been no preseason games, yeah. and you have 32 teams with question marks. Yep. But I thank you so much, and it's always a delight to catch up with you. That's it for now. And make us a habit hanging out at the Behavioral Corner. And when we're not hanging, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter on the Behavioral Corner.